It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Z Garcia. Hey, hey, everybody. Today I am taking a look at this board game called Seitora Repo Tenet Opera Rotas. Though I don't think anybody says the full name and definitely not in that voice. Most people just say Seitor. Uh, this version of the game is actually a, a follow-up to the original release of the game, and it is the same base with a sort of an expansion included the Malleus Maleficarum. Uh, it is a game in which you are going to be moving your little acolyte over a bottomless pit with some um, bridges, trying to gather some ancient tomes, some books, and if you're the first one to get those books, the ones that match your color, well then you win the game, okay? Let me show you how the game works. I'm going to show it to you first without the expansion. Then I'll briefly talk about what the expansion uh, introduces and then we'll come back and I'll tell you what I think of it, all right? So here's what the game might look like set up and ready to begin. I'm going to be showing you the game first without the Malleus Maleficarum expansion in it. And I've also gone ahead and sped up the, the setup it, there's actually quite a bit to it. Each player is going to get a set of these little cards, which they are then going to pick one, and that'll tell you where the books go in your section of the board. Then everybody gets the tiles that are these bridges, and you play them out one at a time on the board until the board is completely populated. You have to make sure that when you are done, all of the books are on a bridge somewhere and nothing is floating over this chasm, so all the books have to be uh, on one of the bridges. And then you're ready to begin. The objective of the game is to get your acolyte to pick up all of the books of your matching color, and the way you're going to be doing that is by spending action points and using these cards to mainly move uh, a bridge and then and or rotate a bridge, all right? So the cards are going to let you, for example, this card right here, features a type of bridge, as seen there, as seen right here. And that is going to allow you for one action point, for example, I can move it once. So I could take this bridge right here and for one action point, move it to there. For two action points, I could move it uh, two spaces, three action points, three spaces. The other type is the ones that let you rotate something. The way something rotates is you pick a pivot point, so let's say I am rotating this piece right here that has three spaces, all right? You pick a pivot point and then you can rotate that however the card allows you to do something like that, for example, just to help you create paths and such. You have six action points on your turn. So let's say I've played these three cards. Once I'm done doing that, and by the way, at the beginning of the turn, I could also have uh, swapped out some cards then I am going to move my Acolyte equal to uh, the number of cards I played uh, of, this, of these kinds of cards. So I could take the Acolyte and move them one, two, three spaces, start getting them onto the board, discard these cards, draw some new ones, and then it's the next player's turn. There's also, during your turn, the ability to take one free move. With that free move, which is, does not count towards your actions, does not need a card, you can move your Acolyte one space, or you can uh, move a bridge one space, or you can rotate once. You can do one of the three things. When it's time to replenish your hand, you're going to discard these, and then you can either draw back up from the deck of cards, which has the rotate and the uh, move cards, or from your own personal deck of cards, and these are a little bit stronger. You can never have more than three of these in your hand, but you are allowed to draw from here and replenish your hand. They'll allow you to do things like move your acolyte considerably more. So if in this instance, you can spend two actions and uh, move up to six spaces, for example. And this one lets you not move at all on your turn, but make up to five moves and rotations and or rotations. This one here lets you destroy one or two bridges from the board as long as no one and nothing is on it. So if I play this, I could, I could take this bridge and completely remove it. Pretty nasty stuff. 
and uh, things like that. That's the idea. You can put out your gargoyle, which uh, locks down a space. It cannot be traversed, and also that tile cannot be moved or rotated. So those are basically your options. Everyone is going to continue doing these actions, playing uh, cards, shifting the board, and then moving their acolyte equal to however many cards they play. They have, again, six actions per turn until you have gathered up all of the uh, matching books and you win the game. Now, the main thing that this new version of the game features is the Malleus Maleficarum, which is uh, the ability to play with this uh, non-player character, a ghost, that's going to start somewhere in the center of the board. There will also be uh, more bridges and such. And this player is going to be actively going after the players and you can control it on other people's turns, okay? So we are going to play, uh, we're going to give up the original deck of cards here, which was our personal stock. You will play without this. And instead, you'll be getting a different uh, deck of cards here. And you'll be using those as your special souped up powers. The objective of the game stays the same. You are trying to move around and collect all of your books first, but Every time you play a card in this version of the game, and so let's say I play uh, this card here, I spend one action and I move something uh, one space, then every other player may discard a card to move the ghost up to two spaces. And so they could do whatever they want to. The ghost can actually fly over the bridges. They do not need to move on the bridges. And if they... Uh, traverse one of the character's spaces, then that player is going to be given a curse. And you're going to take these little tokens, and if you take enough of those, they will start penalizing you for actions you can take. So you'll be able to do less and less. You can, however, take a turn and go into a prayer and get rid of a bunch of those curses. The character that is floating around, the ghost, is trying to grab these black books that will show up every time one of the other books is gone. And so if this character was here, and I can move this acolyte two spaces, one, two, this book is now mine, but a black book appears, and that one is going to be uh, one that the black character at the end of the turn will, will go to, will, will drift to. And again, if it goes over my character or anyone's character, then you're going to start taking curses. So that's mainly the big difference there. You have different cards, as I said, and you are contending with this non-player character that is after you. There's going to be a lot more um, of a take that feel in the game. So that's basically it, and uh, you have now taken a look at both versions, the uh, original and this expansion. So let's go back up top and let me give you some final thoughts. So that should give you an idea of how the game works, okay? My, um, my main issue with this game, I think, is that it sort of feels like it has an identity crisis to me. And here's what I mean by that. The, the box here, which the original was sort of similar, similar look to the game. It looks very dark, very gothic. I like the look of it a lot. It, the whole thing looks like a book on the edges. It's a wonderful design. And yet the game uh, play doesn't quite match the theme for me or this tone. The illustrations on the, the back of the character cards, the ones that, that are your own deck of cards, are very cartoony. But everything else is very dark and dungeony. The game's uh, theme is very thematic, but the game play is very abstract. And so for me, it's again, it's a game of dichotomies. It's the objective is very simple, but the setup is very tricky. You know, it's, it's one of those things that I have a hard time sort of getting into and especially getting other people into. One thing or another pushes people out. It's either the theme, just from looking at the box, they go, mm, no. Or, once they're into that, then they look at the game and they go, well, that's abstract, you know, or, or something. Something pushes them out. So, unfortunately, it's a game that I think has, uh, it's going to have a problem or, you know, kind of finding an audience. I think it's a very uh, esoteric game. 
The game's been out, though, and they put out a new edition, so I'm guessing it's doing well enough that they, they thought that was a worthwhile move. The Malleus Maleficarum expansion in it is interesting. I like that they went ahead and added something that kicks up the interaction quite a bit. Now, it does add a lot of take that, you know, the possibility of discarding cards to, to mess with other people, and every time you discard a card, every time you play a card, rather, every other player around the table can discard a card to move that ghost towards you. So you got to be careful what it is you do, you know. Which is interesting, and I think it does add to the game. I think it makes the game a little bit better than vanilla Sator, but um, I just wonder if it's going to appeal to the same people that the original game appealed to, you know, and again, therein lies another dichotomy. So, um, this one is a review that I think is largely going to be dependent on either what you thought of the original game, if you were familiar with it, or how the game comes across to you from that overview. For me, this is a game that is pretty neat. It's it's sort of bizarre. It's the kind of thing that I might pull out and go, hey, take a look at this weird game, you know, but it's not one that I'm necessarily going to be bringing to the table very often. Um, just not something, again, that I think I'll be able to, to teach to a lot of people or or really even get into. I, I like my abstracts a little bit more straightforward than this and uh, themed games a little less abstract, you know. So, that, that's uh, what I think of it. I do think the production is quite well done. The game uh, bits are excellent. The whole thing is, is very beautiful. But the gameplay is just uh, alright, and it's actually a little bit fiddly for me, too. Every time you're moving those bridges, uh, the little books go flying off of them, and you're, you know, it's... There is a decent amount of fiddliness to the whole thing. So, another uh, point to consider there, if you're really put off by fiddly bits, you might not, you might not want to check this one out, you know. So there you have it, that is Sator, a very interesting esoteric game, and one that just might appeal to you if uh, those are the kind of things you are looking for. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.